Hello everyone, welcome. You're joining me today for a video outside of the usual scope of my videos, but not outside the scope of my interests. This is going to be a one-off, or actually a two-off, a uh, very short run, demonstrating or sharing with you a game that only just came to my attention, despite being a fan of space flight simulators going all the way back to the 80s, playing the very first Star Raiders on my Atari. Um, you know, games like No Man's Sky and Elite Dangerous. Uh, these are games that are sort of in my usual rotation, even though I have never presented them in video format. They're games that I quite enjoy a lot. So I was kind of shocked. I shouldn't say shocked, but I was pleasantly surprised that two days ago, um, this game was, was called to my attention by my random YouTube algorithm. Uh, and I'd never heard of it before, even though it's actually been out and about for about two or three years, um, gaining support. But, uh, I had never heard of it. So, on the off chance that you have never heard of it either, I just wanted to share it because this is a game that falls solidly within the simulation genre. And if you're a regular fan of the channel, then odds are you love a good checklist game and any sort of simulation type game probably, you know, you might have a passing interest in. So I figured why not spread the word. Uh, now I'm seeing a bunch of videos in my feed of, you know, various YouTubers uh, demonstrating or showing off the product. So word is getting out there and I certainly don't pretend to have the same number of followers or influence that some of those other channels do, but, you know, I just wanted to share it with you because I am super excited about it. In fact, I haven't been this excited about a game in a long time. So I decided I wanted to help get the word out, especially because right now uh, their Kickstarter program is going on, and that is a limited time. That is until the end of this month. Actually, it's uh, April 19th. You have until April 19th if you wanted to maybe toss in a few ducats to support this uh, this very small team looking to expand and get out a very interesting game. So why don't we uh, why don't we step into the game itself and. Uh, and take a look around. I, I plan to do just two videos on this. This first one, basic overview. I talk a little bit about what the developers plan to do, what they hope to do, the uh, what this game looks like right now. Um, at least in the in the demo version that we are presented here. So this is very early alpha. In fact, I don't know if you would even call... I mean, it's an alpha build, but I don't know if you would call this an alpha. This is a technical demo. Um, so things are very unfinished, but some of the core systems are in place, and it gives you a taste of what to expect from a more polished uh, product in the future. So, first video, like I said, uh, this is the first video. We'll do a basic overview, and then I'll come back with a second video where I really want to dig in to the nuts and bolts of this because I've... I have a sick obsession with this game already. I've gone in and I've I've started making my own checklists and tracing systems down in the engine room, and uh, I've just been loving it, even in the limited amount of content that we have here. So, why don't we jump in and take a look around and see what we're working with. Welcome aboard the USS Massachusetts. Named in honor of the World War II... American battleship, now a museum ship out in Fall River, Massachusetts. This ship is certainly anything but a battleship, in fact, quite the opposite. This is a Magellan-class exploration vessel, and uh, right off the bat you may notice that it looks suspiciously like a Miranda-class vessel from Star Trek. And uh, if you're not in the know, that is the uh, that is the class of ship from Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, that uh, that the bad guy Khan uh, takes over and goes and fights the Enterprise with. And uh, that same model was reused basically in every TV show that followed from Next Gen uh, through Deep Space Nine and into the movie. So it's a, it's a very common sight uh, among Federation ships in, in any of the, the TV shows. But... Uh, there's a bit of a reason for that, and we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But first of all, you join me here in my captain's quarters, looking out over the Atlantic Ocean out there, Earth just off the uh, port side of the ship. And this is the captain's office. 
we get out of the chair and uh, first of all you have complete options to customize your ship including uh, name prefix if you want to be an HMS something you know if you if anything you want if you want to make it NCC go for it but uh, that is left completely up to the player you can rename uh, your ship change your registration number there's uh, decoration options you can change the colors of your walls flooring the UI panels and uh, even the overhead lighting to a degree it's actually the trim lighting but uh, you you can change that around if you want we look out here I parked the ship a little close to the earth so we're getting a, a bit of pixelation there with the clouds but again Everything you see here is tech demo stuff. Uh, this is not final resolution on any of the, the planets. Limited character customization at the moment, but it's clear that much more will follow. In fact, here in the technical demo, there's, there's various pieces of clothing that are not even available that I've seen in production photos or uh, videos. So the whatever the main build of the game is right now already includes way more. And... Uh, yeah, let's go take a look around and we'll talk about this a little bit. Um, here we are on A deck. This is the command and administrative deck. The bridge is off to our left there. We'll take a look at that later. The armory is located up here. One of the cool things is all of the panels for the doors uh, offer different modes or certain perks that you can, you can actuate if you want. First of all, you've got the doorbell, which does not have a... Uh, a sound there's no wave file or you know whatever file for it for the moment but you can imagine that at some point you'll have a, a little ding dong that you can approach one of the officers ready rooms and be rung in but here's the armory which currently is locked you can lock out or unlock certain vital areas of the ship if you feel it's necessary and you can set it to auto or manual mode so if you don't want the door to just open for every Tom, Dick, and Harry who passes by your, your office, you can go in, you can set mode to manual, and then you can close it. No longer will the door open of its own accord. So let's head aft here. This is the EXO's office on the right. Basically identical to the captain's office. Some of the lighting in the rooms can be adjusted. You can adjust the temperature or brightness. And by temperature, um, it means temperature of the light, not of the room. So as you turn it up, it becomes much colder and more blue shifted. As you turn it down, it becomes more warm and brown shifted. So you have a much more earthy tone, if that's what you're interested in. Across the hall from the XO's office is the conference room. Now what's this? Are we outside? Are we landed on the, the planet? Of course not. We just looked out the window and saw that the Earth is about 8,000 kilometers off our port side. So what's all this? Well, the conference room and the offices and maybe at some point some of the officer staterooms actually have a projection of various scenes uh, that you can put up on the outside of the window and you can maybe just see they're very hard to see and they may be worse in the video but there's actually a uh, a honeycomb pattern which one would assume would be these holographic projectors uh, along the inside of the window you can change that here scene projection grassy hills autumn park misty forest and then if you turn it off you get to see the actual depths of space. Here on this particular room, because it is the conference room, just like the bridge, there's an additional tab for privacy. You can enable privacy mode, which glazes over the doors here, preventing people from just, uh, you know, seeing in. This is a restricted area anyways, according to the doors here, but you know, you can see how dark that is. If there's some sort of serious conversation going on in there, it gives the occupants some privacy from passersby. So we're gonna head down to the lounge and B deck now, and let's start talking about the actual intent of this game. This is the brainchild of a developer named Dan Grovier, or Grovier. 
Uh, he's British. He's uh, located in Somerset, UK. He and his wife right now are the... Uh, well, he's the head developer and she is his business partner. And they are the team producing this game at the moment with the intention of growing a much larger team in the very near future. Now, Dan, this is not his first rodeo. He is known for, uh, I'm pretty sure, being part of the Enterprise DVR project that came out a bunch of years ago. And it was intended to be a one for one walk around of the Enterprise D from Next Generation based on sets, based on technical drawings from both production and, you know, third party books and whatnot. The idea was to be able to just walk around the ship and see every detail, every nook and cranny. People got real excited about it, and then there was some discussion about, oh, well, maybe is it possible to make this thing go? Can we fly it around? The excitement was reaching a fever pitch. Uh, the entire development team, which was just volunteers, you know, no money was to be made from this. They got a cease and desist from, I think it was Param either Paramount or uh, CBS, whoever owns the rights uh, to all the franchise, which I think is Paramount at this point. And so they got shut down, and you can't find that now. They were basically told to, like, destroy or just not be able to present to the public in any way, you know, any of the files that were part of that program. So, as a programmer and a ship designer, Dan, uh, I'm fairly certain, was a part of that group and therefore has lots of experience with that. In the years following that, he made another program, a similar idea, except for the original Enterprise refit model. So, you know, the ship from the original movies. And uh, he has some of those videos still up on his YouTube. And then he was also either part of or director of, I'm not sure which, a more recent Orville project, the TV show Orville with Seth MacFarlane, which is sort of a Star Trek adjacent series. They did the same thing for that show, where they remade the Orville in a VR or first person explorable way like this. Unlike Paramount, the show's creators and the, the distributor love it. Seth MacFarlane apparently has talked about the website or the program on several occasions. I guess you can get it for free off of Steam and uh, associated with an Orville fan site out of the UK, and they made it. So again, more of Dan's work. Now he has created his own company. He and his wife have created this uh, Fleet Yards, or Shipyard, I think it's Fleet Yards. And uh, they are looking to launch this game and looking for support for that. And so that is what they're doing now. So this is actually his third or fourth, maybe even more, foray into ship designing but this is the first time that he's designing a ship on his own from the ground up and he uses actual architectural software he was an architect major at one point in college uh, before he went into it and programming so it's very much a passion project for him this is what drew me to the game is that you know in most space games the ship is really a shell you never see or feel the things that are going on behind the scenes under the hood in this case, everything is designed in a real fashion. Pipes and wiring conduits are laid in ways that make sense. We'll see it uh, later. The electrical and propulsion systems are designed in real ways and have loops that connect. One of his pet peeves, he has stated, is that he hates when panels and games are just decoration and don't do anything. So every panel that you see in this game can be interfaced with and do different things. So if we want to turn off the lighting here in uh, ring two, now the lights are off. We reconnect that. And that brings all of the lights back on. Oh, quick thing, because um, I just noticed that I've, I'm in the wrong camera view. The, uh, the head bob is uh, quite pronounced, at least in this test version, but the nice thing is if you cycle through the different camera modes with C, they do actually present a non-head bob first person, which I find much nicer. Um, so I apologize for having that on for the first bit of this. I forgot that, uh, or didn't notice that it was going on. So, um, so yeah, so that's Dan, his wife Claire. This is their new passion project. So for me personally, being an ex-Navy 
mechanic with an engine room background, nuclear trained, the the entire startup tutorial for the reactor just got me so jazzed because all of the systems are real and they interact in ways that make sense. It um, it felt very much like I was doing my old job, uh, except in a fun way. And that got me super excited about wanting to be able to dive into the systems on this ship uh, and learn how they work. Because the intent of Dan is not to just have a ship that you have to use checklists for. That in and of itself is uh, has very limited potential for fun. No, in this case, the idea of the entire game is we have a one-for-one -one procedurally generated galaxy out there. And here we are in one of Earth's uh, early exploration vessels. And we're going to have to go out there and chart planets and meet new civilizations and, uh, you know, have diplomatic first contact with them. Could be good, could be bad. The ship can take damage. Here in the, in the tech demo, I don't know if that's possible. But what they've outlined for the final product is that your ship can take damage in combat. It needs a uh, it needs preventative maintenance. So we have a PMS schedule in place. You have to do maintenance on different panels or on components, which require you to shuffle around systems and shut things down, do the maintenance, replace items, bring them back online. And if you fail to do that, the items can actually fail, so there's a built-in failure rate on different components within the engineering systems of the ship, and that just sold me, if nothing else did, like that. That's just amazing to me that you have to maintain the ship that you are not only serving on, but also living on. Here's cruise quarters, which uh, are empty at the moment. No detail done to them yet, but the spaces are blocked out, living spaces. The ship will have a fully realized AI crew, but you can also do co-op multiplayer at this time up to 16 players on a server so you can have all your friends or if you're one of those crazy people you can go on a, a randos server and uh you know hope hope that everyone plays nice but you can help other crews out and each person has different responsibilities and that's a thing that i love in games is having a clear responsibility you know I hate when it's just sort of a jumble and you're like oh here's the thing that I can do and then someone else jumps in and they're like well I'll do it better it's like well that's your that's not your job like you're you're doing this other thing so this game while that is an option there is sort of like a standard version where you can just kind of do everything there's also specific role playing if actually if we go to our character customizing again you can see on the left here rank and roll you can set your department what your role is and what your rank is. With my inclination towards wanting to dive into these systems and whatnot, it seems maybe more appropriate that I would choose engineering department and would want to be the chief engineer. And you can see the color changes. We have color denoting departments, which is of course, uh, once again, Star Trek adjacent while still being legally separate. <laughs> and that's sort of the name of the game. It's clear what Dan wants to capture is the excitement, the essence of Star Trek, with the exploration and the uh, diplomacy of that whole franchise, and not make a game that's just sort of for the lowest common denominator, you know, has to be able to be ported to the consoles, and so it has to have lots of action and shooting. Now, there will be weapons and shields in the future, but I get the sense that uh, combat is not the prime motivator of the game. Um, it seems like maybe that's a, a secondary consideration. Having said that, I, I hope that while combat should be rare and and spaced out, I hope that when it does come, it'll be awesome. Like I, I hope that the that the combat component of this game will look awesome and and feel as immersive as everything else does. But um, you know, we have yet to see that yet here in the technical demo. But anyways, back to the rank and roll thing. So I can choose what my rank would be, and I could be the chief engineer. And as the chief engineer now, the de engineering department is my responsibility. And so apparently when jobs come up that needs that need to be done, components that need to be replaced, or uh, you know, if, if damage control needs to be done, there's some way that the game's gonna let you know that. I could either do that myself, uh, delegate it to the AI crew, or 
delegate it to another person who would maybe just be playing a, a regular engineer, you know, uh, an enlisted uh, or an ensign. So you've got low-level junior officers that will be available as ranks and will be roaming the ship, and then you've got the, uh, you know, the hard-nosed enlisted folks who have to do all the actual work and get their hands dirty. So, uh, really exciting. Let's go back to Captain Horner here. So yeah, that's the outlook on that. The game is designed to be a fully immersive, truly a starship simulator, uh, and a galaxy simulator. So taking a look at the, um, the information boards here, we can see we've got got the standard uh, saucer section set up here. Uh, while the ship is very reminiscent of the Miranda class, it's significantly smaller than uh, than that Star Trek ship was. Uh, having said that, though, this ship is listed as having a crew of 300, so it's still a decent amount of people. And in fact, here we are on uh, E deck. This is the lower habitation. Uh, lower habitation ring and you can see here you've got all these crew hab essentially enlisted birthing um, and we saw before they're they're rather large actually let's take a look here at this one you know they're they're rather large so you can imagine that it's gonna be packed full of bunks uh, you know probably three racks on top of each other and then you know maybe some limited like lounge facilities uh, or maybe not, you know, it may just be straight up birthing, which is racks and small lockers. There's several places on the ship, while they're not completed right now, they are earmarked for uh, rest and recreation. You've got the, the park up front, which is like a massive, almost 10 forward kind of room, except it's two decks high, and it's got these massive observation windows out the front. You know, I imagine that at some point, that would be the kind of place where you would go. You know, maybe a lot of greenery um, tables. We saw the, uh, and we'll get back to, the the lounge upstairs up on B deck. Also designed to be a place of, of leisure. And uh, there's a bar there and whatnot. So, yeah, everything is planned out on this ship uh, very specifically. And I'm excited to uh, wait and see how how everything shapes up. Now I mentioned the Kickstarter, and I do just want to... No head bob. I just want to mention that again. Um, if you are interested in this game at all, and want to throw some money towards the developers, uh, I will... I'll leave a link to the Kickstarter down in the description, and if you want to head there and check it out, they have all of the usual levels of donation from... I think it's like one pound or five pounds, you know, all the way up to uh, those levels that they don't expect people to actually take, but they have to, you know, but they put them in there just in case where it's like 5,000 pounds and you get to design one of the future ships. Uh, because this will not be the only ship that is available to you. Um, there's slots for at least three or uh, four more. So there's five slots right now for ships. Uh, the only one occupied is the Magellan class here. And um, apparently if you want to throw a ton of money into the Kickstarter, they'll let you design or help design one of the future ships. So that's pretty interesting. But you don't have to be a millionaire to go support a project like this. You can literally put in a dollar, a couple dollars. You can even pledge your support without donating any money if you just want to help boost the numbers you can uh you can do that too i threw in i think it ended up beating 30 bucks you know whatever the uh whatever the the pounds equivalent of that was i think it was 30 pounds and then i threw in a little bit more and it ended up being like 40 dollars for me like 48 47 bucks so i mean it's not bad i decided to vote with my dollars because this is the kind of game that i want to see more of like i find that the best and most interesting games come from small developers who have similar interests to me. And this used to be the case much more with the PC landscape 15, 20 years ago. You know, you'd be in a PC game store 
you know, back when places like GameStop or like uh, KB Toys actually had racks for for PC games. Uh, they certainly do not anymore. It was always a pleasure to just look through and find, you know, what games were in there. That's literally how I found Strike Fighters 2, which of course is sort of like my signature game that I make videos with. I found that on a rack randomly in a video game store in Virginia Beach one day. Um, well, I lived in Virginia Beach for the Navy, so I was just at my local mall wandering through and lo and behold it's oh here's a game and the package noted that it included an f-105 and that was enough for me to buy it and so that's how i found that game i never would have found it otherwise that game has such a small following or had such a small following here in the united states compared to the europe side of things that there's no way i would have ever been exposed to that game if it had not been for that so anyways that's a long aside to say that I just, I wanted to throw in my support, vote with my dollars, give these guys a small bit of money, which I could spend on a pizza or some like meal or some other game that I maybe don't like as much, or I could give it to them and, uh, and see what happens, you know? And hopefully they take that money. That's the goal is to build a development team using that money and get this thing rolling. And so, yeah, so I decided for the first time ever, by the way, I've never kickstarted anything ever before in my life. I had to sign up with Kickstarter and make an account to fund these guys, but I, uh, I was that excited to do it, so I did. So if you are of the mind, and if it is prior to April 19th when you watch this, consider maybe dropping some money over there. Give them some ducats to show your support. And, uh, yeah, you know, maybe in a couple of years here, we'll have a really kick-ass game if everything turns out the way that they want. So, I think that's all I, I wanted to, uh, talk about there. Just the overview of the game. Why don't we start taking an actual tour of the ship, and instead of just, uh, blabbing and trying to get all the bullet points off, uh, that I had in my head that I wanted to discuss, you know, why don't, why don't we actually take a look at the ship do some commentary regarding that as we are down here on the on F deck which is the almost the bottom deck of the ship we'll head down to G deck which is the very bottom uh, F and G decks are our engineering spaces this is where all of the primary engineering equipment we can see some here where well, these are the cryo storage tanks for the coolant and the fuel for our reactor so let's head into the main reactor space and uh, and start our tour there. So here we are in main engineering, looking at our uh, our main reactor. It's four decks high. We're up here on D deck, looking down uh, on the entirety of the thing. And if we head back down to G deck, down to the very bottom, we can see we've got some AI crew members walking around. The game assigns them random names and uh, attire. And you do have an option in the settings to uh, display their character name and what they're doing. You, you can basically see what their job is. You'll notice a chicken just ran out of here and is cruising through the halls. And uh, this made me, <laughs> he's just going into this room here. We're, this is, we're in the start capacitor room. This apparently is, <laughs> this is Admiral Cluck Norris, which I don't know if this is based on a real chicken that the, uh, that the developers own or if they just like chickens and uh, they made this their mascot, but this apparently is some sort of mascot for the project, for the ship. Uh, because one of the... one of the... Oh, bye! <laughs> one of the things that you can purchase as like a side donation in the Kickstarter is an in-game plushie of Admiral Cluck Norris, which I guess basically is like a placeable item that you can put, say, in your office or 
in your quarters, so funny little chicken man. So here we are, this is the main reactor controls back to business here. You can see there's various systems in and out of the the uh, reactor pressure vessel itself. In fact, here is the coolant uh, in inlet and outlet lines, and in fact, they've got some like flow markers on them. These, uh, these square things are the valves, they're push button valves. Here's the inlets and outlets for fuel, and in fact, they're even color coded, which is awesome. This is the de uh, the deuterium line, which is purple. I found that especially funny because purple was what we would paint the JP5 fuel lines on board the ship. You know, every system, just like real life, is color coded. The system itself would be labeled on the pipes. I don't know if we'll end up seeing something like that, but. Um, you know, the color coding is sort of a nod to real life. Uh, you can see sort of some bizarre flange work here, but this is a thing you see around the ship a lot. We've got a sticky here telling us that it's a work in progress. So WIP, a lot of things are work in progress. You have a lot of objects that are either placeholders or are going to get some, you know, some further detail in the future. So uh, once again, this is sort of a, this is a pre-alpha tech demo, essentially, but um, there is simulated fluids running through these lines. These are super cooled gases that have now become fluid form and they are running in and out of the reactor to maintain both the temperature and the reaction itself. Here is our electrical distribution system. And you have basically power coming from the reactor feed Supplying high voltage distributors, which are these one, two, three, four, five panels off to our left here. And these are going to power things like the sublight propulsion. Here's the weapons and shield systems. Here's the FTL system. This is the battery charging system. Most of the systems on the ship actually run off the batteries. We have a we have a battery system, so actually very similar to the World War II submarines from the Silent Hunter series. We're putting power in from the reactor and then all of the lighting and utility systems of the ship are actually run off of the batteries. And that, that provides some good emergency backup. Uh, if we dump the reactor for some reason, if we lose power, you know, we have several minutes of backup power to try to get things going again. The, old, the systems that the reactor directly powers are everything off to the right here, F, all these subsystems here, FTL, shields, weapons, and sublight. So you can have all these secured and uh, basically have the ship in a, a ready state, you know, a, a non-flight ready state where basically you're, you would be in port or orbiting a planet, let's say, you know, and you could shut all that stuff down and just run the reactor on its lowest power just to charge the batteries. Also on this deck, we've got the maintenance tunnels, which are once again similar to but legally distinct from Jeffrey's tubes. And they run out along the outer rim or ring of the uh, of the saucer section here and there's a lot of electrical components. There's various buses out there. Uh, we'll see that at another time. Here are various pumps. So the coolant I'm sorry, this is the coolant and the fuel from these tanks is getting pumped, is running from this equipment. It's it's there's a pump here, we've got a a chiller, which is essentially a heat exchanger, which is which is super cooling those gases down to make them liquid. And uh, all of those fluids are are flowing from here back to the reactor room and through the reactor. The remainder of F deck, going up one, is basically uh, all of our batteries. This is this is all of the batteries here. The the way that the electrical system is split up, it's in four quadrants, with two battery rooms per quadrant, and then there's uh, uh, twelve battery arrays between the two rooms, um, and then each array is made up of I think it's ten cells. This is our way to access the cargo holds and the shuttle bay. So at the aft end of the ship, we do have a shuttle bay. Uh, this I think is gonna be storage. 
again we're bear with me we're getting into the uh the unfinished sections of the ship here this is uh a little bit of has a back rooms feel to it. it's very liminal space but uh but this is going to be the hangar bay and you can see up there up on the deck above we've got sort of a control room that overlooks um there's going to be workshop and and hangar space off to the side it looks like the bay itself is quite large and may fit shuttles of varying sizes i don't know for sure it's just an educated guess that we'll probably get some different shuttle types one of the missions of the magellan exploration vessels when they reach these these planets they're going to scan them with both probes and sensors but also to actually land on them so there's going to be a a first person planet visiting capacity which we'll see how that goes that's awesome uh i like that in several other games you know it's a component of uh, several games that are already on the market now with varying degrees of success so i'm looking forward to see that integrated into this this game as well We'll make our way up to the next deck up. There is a lift here, a turbo lift, an elevator planned to be implemented at some point. At the moment, it's got the work in progress sticker on it, but they do denote that it is a lift. So at some point, you'll be able to come in here and there'll be a panel to, to command what deck you want to go to. At the moment, um, or for emergency use, you do have the staircase. Which, has, uh, which is framed by some pleasant greenery already. And then, uh, as we saw before, this is the habitation lower deck. So essentially you've got, um, actually, well, let's find a, a panel, but basically you've got all the crew berthing on this level. Do we have any shops or things here? Oh, we've got the park. So this is, this is really a habitation ring. Um, hydroponics uh, and medical will be on this level. Oh, hell, let's go take a look. Again, uh, a section of the ship that's not finished, but uh, but we can go take a look. Interesting note, one of the things that I found really hard the first day was navigating the ship. On a real ship, you have long corridors that you know that you're heading either aft or forward. You, it gives you a little bit of... Um, an idea of like what direction you're facing, right? Are you going forward? Are you going aft? Here in a circular designed ship, you lose all that. And I had never really considered that, you know, seeing the uh, seeing the sets of Star Trek Next Generation where they're always walking in the circular hallways. Well, it never occurred to me how completely disorienting that is. Uh, and you get real lost. Now, after, after about two or three days of Navigating the ship and reading the signage, I, I feel much more comfortable about where I'm going. But here we are. This is the very front of the ship. Once again, this is going to be a two-level affair. Um, and the fact that it doesn't have a ceiling built into this deck tells me that it's probably going to be some sort of balcony that runs along the outside there through those two doors uh, into the main door there. And then I think there's supposed to be some doors over here. But you can see here we've got the, the two-story observation glass. And you can do something really fun. You can, just, you can step out onto it and just be able to have a panoramic view of space around you. You can imagine doing this in real life. Here I am standing on it. You would just be, you know, able to, to stand on the front of the ship and just feel like you're out in space. Things start to get interesting up on the next deck, though, up here on C deck. Now we're coming to the science labs, and this is where a, the majority of the work of the ship will be completed. You can see here, basically, it's all science labs running all the all the way around the ring. Uh, in the center here, in this in this uh, turret area in the middle, is the data center, which. Right now is empty, but I assume will probably be the location of, say, the ship's computer archives. But uh, everything on sea level, all science labs, and, and uh, 
oceanography is going to be here. Uh, this lab here. Again, nothing in it unpowered, unlit at the moment, but at some point it will be full of both scientists and science equipment. Hold on, I think one is lit. These are the these are the inner labs here. Oh yeah, here we go. So here in the test build, uh, they've usually put lights in at least one of the rooms on on a deck to kind of give you an idea of of how they'll look lit. So this would be one of the inner labs, and once again would have a full AI crew of scientists working on various equipment. So here we are up on B deck, um, and you can see here, here's the work in progress and the lift post-it notes denoting what this little closet is going to be. And uh, this is the deck uh, for all of the staterooms for the primary department heads of the ship. So you've got six staterooms uh, around this ring. This one's lit. I don't know if that means that it's going to be the captain's quarters, but this is... Uh, what it looks like and I find this this is humongous I feel like if they cut this in half this would still be a big stateroom for a ship because you've got all this space here and then this is the actual bedroom here's our temporary object block denoting where the bed will be uh, and then you've got this area which would be probably closet bathroom and shower would be my my guess uh, so, I mean, look how enormous this is. My feeling is, though, is that they give you all this space uh, in order to have the room to customize uh, the room to your liking. And and if it's a ship full of your friends, you know, if, if you have a full crew of, uh, of multiplayers, then each person can have their own room and... Uh, they talk about how the, the game has a, an object permanence system in place. So if you pick up interesting doodads from, for, uh, from alien planets, you can bring them back on the ship and place them as decorations and they're not gonna go anywhere. They're gonna remain where you, where you set them. So it seems like you can, you're gonna be able to decorate these rooms out to your heart's content. And they're quite large so you could you could have sitting areas and have some of your friends over. And of course, the most likely will be those panels to be able to customize your lighting preferences as well. Again, this is just temporary lighting. This is not the finished product, but they just lit it up, uh, it seems, so that we can see. But each of the other staterooms is identical. They're just powered off. Where's my, my flashlight? So yeah, that is the uh, that is the majority of B deck. This is also how we access the VIP lounge. Oh, you can see here more random works in progress <laughs> stickers. Um, but here's the lounge, uh, and access to A deck and the bridge. But one of the jobs on board is going to be what they call the morale officer. And uh, that is a combination of ship's bartender, cook, and I guess some other things, but this is the galley. This is the main ship galley. This is food storage, which they, I find is hilarious. They denote by just putting in some, some random food objects. So uh, probably just some default unreal objects that they've thrown on the floor here to just show Hey, this is where food storage is going to be. This is the galley itself. This is where food prep will take place. Uh, again, here is the, the uh, electrical distribution. Not for B-deck, but just for the lounge area. And out here we do have, we have the bar. It's not clear what sort of actual eating or drinking you might do, but uh, some sort of interaction uh, with the bartender. Uh, as a way to keep ship's morale up, I guess. I enjoy this. We've got the we've got the playable piano here. 
It also could be that this is literally just a placeholder item and is not an object intended to be here. I guess we'll see. But um, it is a fun little touch right here at the moment. So yeah, you can imagine that this this little this VIP lounge probably mainly for officers, I would guess the officers of the ship. Uh, probably not so much the enlisted, but uh, you can imagine this would be a fun, you know, low-key party atmosphere, getting drinks served, looking out at the ship as we traverse the stars. Now over here on this side, we have storage and we have a restroom, and apparently part of the AI pathing and uh, scheduling, oh, you can see <laughs> we've got our holiday decorations in here, just waiting to be hauled out for the next uh, Christmas season. But here's the bathroom with some items in it. But yeah, apparently part of your AI crew's um, pathing and task priority is going to be to take bathroom breaks. So they'll stand watch, they'll do maintenance, they'll have to take bathroom breaks, they'll sleep. So, you know, a little bit of uh, Sims action, keeping everybody busy throughout the day and I can't wait for that because that is the type of thing that just would make the ship feel lived in um, so very much you know it's not just empty like this uh, we saw downstairs as there's some people wandering around um, but at the moment here in the technical demo engineering is the only space that has AI crew obviously a thing that will change in the future but just demonstrating what that kind of looks like uh, at the moment but yeah there's nobody up here so the ship definitely feels empty it feels unlived in up here. Um, and eventually we'll have people coming and going. I don't know if you'll be able to, say, manage the the watch rotation times. I think that would be kind of cool. Like you could set what your watch rotations are and what time they get on and off. Do you set a port starboard schedule where it's 12 hours on, 12 hours off, which is a, a standard rotation for modern Earth Navy ships uh do you set an eight hour watch rotation where you do three you know sets of eight hours do you do six and sixes you know i, I think maybe some it would be too micromanaging for some people and i get that uh but i think as a mic if you wanted to micromanage that i think that would be a fun tool to have which actually brings me to a discussion before we go on the bridge Another thing that I like about this game so much is that it's going to have all this detail in it. And if you want to get down in the weeds and, uh, you know, do like I want to do and trace out systems and learn the ins and outs of everything you can. But on, at the same time, the game doesn't require you to do it. If you don't want to do that, you don't have to. And that's a thing that I appreciate in games all the time is not forcing a player to play one way only because people play games different ways they get enjoyment out of doing different things so let's say you like flight simulators and you you enjoy being a checklist guy in a flight sim and following everything but in this game you don't want to do that maybe you just want to go out and explore and find aliens and, and do all that stuff you don't have to go down to engineering at all you delegate all that to your AI crew and your chief engineer takes care of it. That's that's the, the whole point of having a crew. Um, you know, I say this in, in Silent Hunter, you're not a cartoon villain who has to run the entire submarine by himself, you know? And so it's sort of the same thing here. If you want to do stuff, you can, but you can delegate. In fact, there's even an option in the character customization that if you just want to be a passenger, you don't even have to have a job to do. You can literally just hang out on the ship and uh, watch as the AI captain takes the ship out into space and uh, and the crew works around that. So it's a very interesting option, you know, if you wanted to do that. Let's take a look at the, the bridge now. Here we are on the main nerve center of the Massachusetts. Again, not completed. Uh, you can see here we've got a couple of nooks which are going to have most likely additional equipment in it. There you can see here another work in progress thing, but you can... Uh, we've got polarization controls for the windows. If we wanted to cut down on glare, you can do that. Um, 
I think that this control also controls the VIP lounge windows, but I don't... That may not be the case. I felt like it did in passing, um, but you can, you can see it definitely controls all of the bridge windows, including the upper panes. But uh, let's turn that back off because I like having a nice clear view of, of the planet. So here on the bridge, now we get into the game truly being a bridge simulator, uh, except as we've seen with an entire actual ship attached to it, not just the bridge as some other games are. Here are the command chairs. This I assume would be for the Captain XO. They don't seem to be marked specifically for one or the other, so I guess it's uh, Captain's preference. Here you've got the alert conditions where you can set the different alerts. Here we're in yellow. It's a very subtle change because uh, there's so much light coming in right now, but we are in yellow. All of the trim lights have changed to yellow. If we go to red alert, we have flashing red, and this flashes red throughout the entire ship. You can imagine that, you know, at some point we'll have a klaxon that goes off, we'll have some sort of uh, alarm that signals battle stations. We have emergency lighting, which is just an all red hue. And then we've got a, a couple of test modes here, uh, developer modes, disco mode, which gives kind of a, a fun party vibe. <laughs> but I think what it's actually doing is uh, testing the RGB on all of the lights for developer reasons, you know, making sure that all of the lights in a particular space can be customized um, either manually by the player or through different actions of, of uh, events. Because, um, and I say that because here we have we have test alien virus, which basically does the same thing, except, oh no, there's some sort of virus in our system and all the lights are going wonky and it does this all throughout the ship and it's it's actually very off-putting. This is, they found the that perfect shade of like, shit your pants green. That's just like, it just makes you feel uncomfortable. <laughs> um, so yeah, so here you can imagine some sort of enemy, hostile enemy virus has messed with your ship and now you're in damage control mode to try to eradicate whatever this virus is and get the ship back to normal. But So we'll go back to normal lights here. So that's this is the command chair, also offering you a view of the center, uh, or central map system, which we'll take a look at in a second. Over here is the uh, what appears to be planned as the tactical officer's area. At the moment, literally only having an uh, emergency blast shield control. This side is our navigator station, navigator and sensors. And uh, by selecting our buttons here, we actually bring up different modes for the map. Here's the star system uh, range in astronomical units. And using that station, you can scan for other star systems or objects, send it to the helm. And this is where the rubber meets the road. This is the main helm station autopilot so you can fly manually and in fact keyboard controls allow you to to yaw pitch and roll or you can engage the autopilot and it'll make the journey on its own there's an entire navigation system over here and in fact I want to make use of that right now and let's get the ship underway real quick and uh, and show you what that is like. So uh, the the coordinate system in use allows you to, in my case, just write down the name of an interesting place. You can see saved targets here. It seems like in the future you'll be able to save important coordinates to be able to return, say, home to Earth or to space stations or, you know, some, some other uh, area of interest in the galaxy but uh, at the moment we're just doing some some manual input so let's go to this uh, we'll just we'll just plan a trip to the uh, to this planet that I found enter so here we go we have now inputted manually a target coordinate and you can see it has shown up it's telling us that we have 140 light years to go and uh, we're gonna see the speed of the ship is quite high, but even so, it's going to take over 30 minutes to reach 
this destination. I think that the that the speed that they have selected was probably it was probably made with gameplay considerations. It's probably the uh, just the right balance of being able to reach places in a decent amount of time, but still being able to feel like you're going deep into the galaxy uh, for very long missions or long trips if you if you want to. It gives you a sense of being able to travel the galaxy and not being able to just fast travel back to Earth or many of these destinations. It makes you feel like you're actually going somewhere. So so here we go. So we have we have marked our target. We are ready to rock. We engage FTL. There's a little bit of a sound and vibration that indicates that we are now underway. And you can see here it's telling us that we're at 30 kilometers a second. So pretty fast by earthly standards, but fairly slow by space standards. You can see this is sort of a sedate orbital speed almost. The outside of the ship, which again is a work in progress. It is missing based on the uh, the illustrations of the ship. It's missing some some upper and lower roll bars in the back. Uh, and in fact, the, the you can see there's the hangar bay, but parts of the ship are open in the back, so they haven't even installed the the back bulkheads, the aft bulkheads of the ship. One of the updates to the technical demo, I guess the next iteration, is going to have a more complete starship. So here we are, we're on our way out. There's uh, Spain, the Straits of Gibraltar, down underneath us, the entire Mediterranean there is actually obscured by that one large cloud, but uh, yeah, Europe, oh, there's the UK and Ireland up there to the north. So you can see, as we get a little further away, the texture resolves itself and is a little bit better, and you can kind of see where we're at on the planet, but we're going to go away real fast now as I start cranking up the, uh, the engine speed here. There we go. Accelerating away, leaving Earth behind. Heading out into the depths of space now. Back to first person. If we engage, the ship will steer automatically towards our manual target, and then we'll engage... Uh, we would have to engage FTL if we hadn't already, but because we had, we're now up to 100%. And here we are flying out of the system. You can see the target speed is two and a half million times the speed of light. And there we go, we've just reached it now, so that's 100%. And I think, what was it? Is that 300 light years a second? Something like that. Uh, they mention it uh, in the tutorial and in the technical specs what the top speed of the ship is. So yeah, so now we're just on our way. You can see it gives us an ETA of 30 minutes. And if we head back over here to the sensors, we can engage the stellar region and set 50 light years. And now we see uh, our stellar region, our local cluster of stars that are available to us on our sensors within 50 light years. And from here, we could select a target. We could select any one of these. Uh, let's take Alpha Centauri, for example. And then if we scan the target, it brings up all the information of that star and tells us there are six known system objects in it. And so those include several terrestrial planets, gas dwarves, the star itself. Clicking on any of these, you could send to the helm and uh, automatically select that as the destination for the autopilot or for the helmsman if he's in manual control. Down here, you can shift through the different filters, black holes or b-hole, <laughs> which made me laugh hysterically. Uh, no O class, here's three B class, Bravo class stars. A class is a lot of them. F, G, and so on and on and on. So it looks like M class is uh, the yellow type star that we are used to at home. Is that is that true? I forget what, what class our 
star is, but it looks like we're... Oh, Wolf 359, we could go encounter the Borg there. Yeah, it looks like we've uh, looks like we've moved out of range, perhaps of of soul. But anyways, that's how you would find objects of interest here in the in these at the sensor station. So I guess that kind of wraps up everything that I wanted to uh, talk about in this video. Like I said, this was supposed to be just sort of a basic overview in terms of what the game wants to do how the ship is designed and built, what to expect from the AI crew in terms of having assignments and uh, having to perform preventative maintenance on the ship. Again, I will, I will include the links to both the Kickstarter campaign and the, uh, and the developer's main page. Obviously, uh, they have way more information over there than anything you'll learn from me secondhand, so if you are interested and want to learn more about the vision or or see some actual gameplay from a more complete version of the game, uh, you can head over there. That'll be down there. And if this does interest you and you want to join me in some real nuts and bolts discussions of what I've discovered so far in just the few days that I've been exploring this game, uh, stick around for episode two, which will come out shortly hereafter. And... Uh, that's going to be a complete startup shutdown of the electrical and reactor systems. I hope this was a fun little departure from the usual stuff that we see uh, on this channel, but you know, I hope you liked it anyways. All right, great. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see you next time.